Hello there and welcome to another special edition of the Double Digit Hockey Podcast and Show. Today I'm joined by a very special guest on the show. Uh, he works at the Fan 960 as a radio personality uh, and he's got plenty of it. I'm grateful that he's taking time out to share some with me today. Peter Klein, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm doing great. Uh, that was quite the intro. I, I don't know if I'm any of those things, but I, I appreciate it. You're definitely a personality. We'll give you that one, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll dive right in here because uh, we don't you know, go over time like I always do. Uh, I have the, the Dean Molberg version of time clock management. So <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll get into it here and we'll start talking about things. Flames coming up a pretty interesting game, we'll call it, on Saturday. Um, Friday when you were on your show, the big show on the Fan 960, you were very... Very opinionated and very to the point about what you thought about the Flames, which I agree with a lot of what you were saying. What did Saturday teach you about the Flames? <laughs> um, I don't know if Saturday was as much about the Flames as it was about Edmonton. Um, I, I think, and specifically the the problems in goal that Edmonton has. Like I, I think uh, a lot of that game was Koskinen is just exhausted and is having trouble keeping the puck out of his net, which kind of is the job. Um, <laughs> so I, I honestly, like honestly, I don't know how much we learned about Calgary in that game. Like the the first period was abysmal, um, and we we have established yes. that they can. That we, we've established they can be very very bad in the first period and still win hockey games, which I guess is a sweet thing to know but i like after that th this still wasn't a team that was going to the hard areas because edmonton I, again koskin was having trouble keeping the puck out so you could score from distance and it was fine and then edmonton's blue line this is going to come across a bit more crass than i want it to but edmonton's defensive group doesn't exactly create a lot of tough areas if that makes sense so i i I would love to say that oh, from it. the fl from the, the Flames' perspective, that we we have learned so much because they they scored a bunch of goals against Edmonton. But I, I don't I don't think that we really took much away from a Calgary perspective from that game. They have a Dreisaitl and they have a McDavid, so they will create, they will play hard, and they will make you look silly at times. But are you concerned at all with the Flames giving up as much as they gave up on the defensive end? A little bit. Uh, yeah, I, I am. Um, and a, a lot of it is chances off of the rush, right? And again, when you're facing Connor McDavid, he's going to do that <laughs> a couple of times. So it, it's tough to, like, you kind of have to grade it on a bit of a scale in, in that sense. But I, I think for the Flames, not just in that game, but throughout the season, the, the big thing that I've had a lot of concerns with is how many on-man rush they're, rushes they're giving up. And that they kind of cut down on that a little bit against Edmonton, but not enough. And that that is something you can't keep doing because whether like Ottawa we're seeing this year isn't very good. But if you give Brady Kachuk an odd man rush opportunity, if, if you give Stutzel an odd man rush opportunity, they're going to capitalize. Same thing with everyone else in this division, right? Like they have high-end players mm -hmm. who can take advantage of those opportunities. And so defensively in their own end, the, the forwards, we know some of them, um, specifically a couple of them who have threes in their number, um, aren't necessarily the, the hardest to, to play against defensively. But I think that the big issue for me is how many turnovers lead to odd man rush opportunities. And <laughs> uh, you have a goalie who can bail you out on a few of those, but eventually like those are just going to go in. So that's, that, that's my biggest concern for Calgary so far. I'm glad you mentioned the turnovers because that's for me is the biggest thing that I've watched this team defensively is the amount of turnovers that they are giving up, whether it's a lack of communication on the ice or whether the game plan is a little different than I, I think. But when you have someone pinch, like these are active defensemen and you have them pinch, there's no forward covering. And that's pretty concerning for me on a whole for a team perspective. You mentioned Gaudreau and Monaghan in your answer there as well. How important for them is it to continue to get those offensive chances rather than having to rely on them defensively? Oh, it's huge. Like if you, you rely on them defensively, you are uh, screwed. Um, uh, so for like Mo Monaghan has improved his defensive game quite a bit. Um, he, he is still, I would suggest below average in that, but he has, he has at least put in the effort and he's at least working on it. But like Gaudreau and Monaghan are never going to get a selkie vote in their lives. So you, you, you do not want to rely on them defensively. The, you can make the argument for some of the defensive zone start numbers that we saw or offensive zone start numbers that we saw from them 
at the early part of the season because a lot of the success that those guys have is, again, coming off of the rush. And it's tough to do that when you're in the offensive zone. Um, but at some point, like, they're just a liability in the defensive end. And so for them, they need to outscore those issues. They, they need to outchance the chances that they're giving up. That, that's how this sport works. So I, I'm a little bit concerned for them, um, and, and it is – it is wildly important that those guys produce offensively because that's that's just their thing, right? The one thing that concerns me about that line is the continue, and it's been a problem since they were essentially put together. Outside of the Lindholm on that line for the year and a half, two years he's been around, it's been a revolving door on the right side of Monaghan and Gaudreau. Are you concerned about that at all? Because they really haven't found an answer this season either for it. Yeah, I there, there's part of me that concern that's concerned, and there's part of me that isn't. There, there are like teams will cycle through guys at times. Like it, it is, it, it would be awesome if this was just NHL 20, and you just set your lines and you just simmed it, and it was fine. Um, but that that's not that that's not how this works. So I, I don't mind a revolving door. My issue is that they've needed a revolving door, if that makes sense. Like if mm, yes. th there wouldn't be that revolving door if someone just fit there, and I, I think. You kind of have a fit with Manjapani, but he fits so well with Backlund that it's tough to break those guys up. It, it kind of a, a robbing Peter to pay Paul situation. So I, I do I, I do think that it would be nicer to have someone who is just like that Yuri Hoodler for one season. It fits, it works, it's great, awesome. But I, I don't, uh, until you find that, I don't mind trying to find a bunch of different answers. Uh, I, I think this organization would love if it was Sam Bennett because that fixes a few problems. But yes. I, I do think that they would, I, I do think that that is something they're going to be looking for. We'll get to, we'll get to Sam Bennett a little bit, <laughs> in a little bit here. Um, there is a couple of talking points there, but we'll get there. Um, there is a crowd out there that have been lobbying to split Monaghan and Gaudreau up. They've been lobbying that for a couple of years now. We've seen articles written on it. Uh, we've even seen The Athletic take a deep dive into breaking those two up. Are you on team leave them together, let them ride, or are you on team let's try something new? I, I am on team leave them together. Uh, I think that the, the numbers would suggest that they haven't been great when they're apart. And I think one of the, the issues I have with this team and with those two guys specifically is that it kind of feels like 95% of the roster plays one way. And then you have those two who play a different way. And I just, I don't know if there's really that fit with anyone else. Like having uh, Matthew Kachuk as a playmaker for Sean Monaghan, it, it works in theory. But then you lose part of the, the game for Matthew Kachuk, where I, I think he's pretty responsible in the defensive end. And we've already discussed uh, of the three ends, that's not the one Monaghan wants to spend a lot of time in. So mm -hmm. I, I don't, I think that, to, to put like Gaudreau with Lindholm, let's say, or to put Kachuk with Monaghan, that kind of erases the point of having a Kachuk and erases the point of having a Lindholm, where you want these guys who can play that 200-foot game. And I feel like if you put someone who is, up until this point, a defensive liability, it kind of takes away the, the strength of those guys a little bit. So I like having uh, a Kachuk, Lindholm, Dubé, whoever, um, as a line, and then they're just comfortable doing the defensive, like the 200-foot game, whatever. You have back on a Manjapani and winger X who can be kind of your de facto, like these are like 100% zone uh, defensive zone starts, and you just ride with that. Um, I, I don't mind having those and then having a, a Gaudreau and a Monaghan. That's just a, you go out there, you put the, the round thing into that net, and we just, we'll, we'll go from there. I, I, I like the, having that offensive kind of line. So I, I think that... If you had a couple other guys who just kind of fit that that offensive mindset, then maybe. But I, I think that you're kind of breaking up some lines that are really good 200-foot uh, groups in the process. Yeah, well said. Uh, kind of wish we had a debate there, but I'm in, the, I'm in the exact same mind frame as you. You let those two <laughs> just ride. You, yeah. you live and die by what they bring to the table. But without Monaghan and Gaudreau, the argument can be made that this team is not going to score enough goals to be successful. So that led to the depth conversation that I want to have with you. This offseason, Jeff Ward, I'm assuming he took the reins on this and went to moving guys to center, went to creating the internal depth. Now we see the three centers, one, two, three, nice and deep. Uh, they've been paired with a nice winger, and then they've been looking for that third winger on most of these lines. Do you prefer that way, or are you the old school way of thinking of loading up those two lines and letting the team ride? 
I, I, I prefer to spread it out. I, I do think that there are merits to, to both sides, but I, I do, I do kind of like spreading out the, the love a little bit. And it just, it makes life so much easier when you can just roll those four lines. Like we are seeing different teams be able to do that. Like Vegas, for example, has been able to do it at times. Tampa Bay could roll like nine lines if they wanted to with the forward yes. group that they have. Um, and, and while like watching, Watching McKinnon and Ranson and Landis Cog do their thing is really, really fun to watch. But then they've done a good job of improving the depth there too. But th there was a time where after that it was, okay, we can breathe. And so I, I like that you're able to to spread that out a little bit. It would be great if the fourth line could be that as well. They certainly have not been so far this season. But yeah, I, I kind of, I, I like having the, the pairs sort of and, and spreading it out that way. Yeah, me too. I'm with you on that one. I like that the Flames recognize that they're not they're not able to load up and hang with a lot of these other what you call the elite teams, the Vegases, the Colorados that you mentioned, the Lightnings, that they've used to the best of their ability to make the three lines, and that allows for other matchups down further on your lineup. One of those that they are allowed uh, being allowed to do is get Monaghan and Gaudreau out against third lines, which we're seeing the success of. And in turn, that's giving the focus to Michael Backlund's line to do what he needs. they need him to do, and that shut down the other team's top lines. What have you seen from Michael Backlund? For me, he struggled coming out of the gates. What have you seen from Michael Backlund this year? I've, I've seen struggles as well. And when we go back to Saturday's game, that was the best he's looked this season. Uh, mm -hmm. The bar not set particularly high, but he cleared it with flying colors. Um, he... There's just there, there's so many more mistakes from him than I'm used to seeing. Like that, the the turnover against Kyle Connor um, in, in one of the Winnipeg games was like that was just a handoff. Like that that looked like part of the Super Bowl, and you just you don't see that from him. And there are times where he's just getting straight beat in the front of the net, and that that's just. I I wish I knew why. Like I wish I could say, oh well, he's doing X, Y, and Z, so fix it. But there's just, I don't know if it's a confidence thing. I don't know if it's how weird this offseason was or how weird training camp was. But th there was just something off with him. And, and I do wonder if, because we, we talked about it on the show, the first five games of the season, he had different line combinations each time. And not just one, like it's not just, it was him and Manjapani, and then it was Lucic or Bennett or, or whoever. It was one game, it was Manjapani and Bennett. And then the next one, it's Levo and Lucic. And so it's just all these different guys. And it's tough to get that familiarity when you're working in the defensive zone. And so much of that is chemistry and knowing where the other guys are going to be. And so... This is definitely probably giving him way too much of the benefit of the doubt, but there is, a, a, I think there was a bit of trying to do three people's jobs all at once. And I wonder now that we've kind of settled into the season, we are oh, uh, 11 games in, I think, from a Flames perspective while we're talking. And so I think for them, uh, and I think for him, that this is now past the point where the preseason would have been. Like we are, if you had a mm -hmm. preseason that was a regular length, that's usually like nine games, which is ridiculous, but we we are now past that point and you're starting to get that familiarity and he's starting to get going. So that that's a very long-winded way of saying, I think he's going to be fine. I just think that there was a, a bit of a chemistry issue with him. Yeah, I agree with that. What, you don't like the nine preseason games, that one random Islanders preseason game we really seem to get? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not a fan. Not a fan. I, I, yeah. I, for, like, I like the split squad thing. I think that's fun. Um, yes. But aside from that, like we... We're probably good after four. I've I've never been an NHL player. I'm 31. I probably won't be. So I don't really know how many preseason games they need. But it's probably not nine. It's probably not that many. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm almost 37. So I'm pretty sure I would be at retirement age in the NHL right now. So uh, <laughs> pretty weird to think. So um, <laughs> let's uh, let's have that Bennett conversation that uh, I so graciously yep. skipped earlier in the show here. Sam Bennett. We all know the story. Elliot Freeman broke it on Hockey Night Canada, requested the trade. He went on and played, a, I would call it a, a decent game or two there, and then he was healthy scratched, then put back in the lineup, and he looked he looked okay at times against, against Edmonton, but at other times I thought he looked lost. Where are you on Sam Bennett where he stands with the team currently? <laughs> I th that is uh, an interesting question because it's changed, like you said, seven times uh, throughout the week. Mm -hmm. I thought Saturday, because like we, it it's not like when that news came out on Saturday, everyone was saying, "Oh my gosh!" But it's been going so well. 
Like that, no one said that. We, we all knew like that this was not going fantastically with Sam Bennett and the Calgary Flames. And mm-hmm. so I, I kind of, in my mind, he was the one who was leaving for Seattle at the at the end of the season. Like he he is left unprotected. You get a draw of former first round pick. We can fix this guy, yada, yada, yada. And so I, I thought that that would be the pick. And then the news came out Saturday and I was like, okay, I still think it's Seattle though. Like I just, I think this season is so difficult to make trades in. We're seeing it with, with Winnipeg against uh, Winnipeg and Columbus. Like it, it took to, uh, took Dubois two weeks to play. And in, in a season that's going to be this close in a division, that's going to be this close. You can't really afford to have that happen. And so if you're going to trade Sam Bennett for anything coming back, which I think you should be, I, I, I think it's a little risky. And so I I went from thinking Sam Bennett was going to go to Seattle to thinking that Sam Bennett was going to go to Seattle. And then Thursday happened and they're scratching him. And it's like, okay, you're not doing that unless like there's a trade happening now, now, now. Mm-hmm. Because to your point, I thought he was fine Monday and Tuesday. Like he wasn't, yeah. he didn't work his way out of that tier where it was inconceivable mm-hmm. that he would be scratched. But you have to know when you're scratching him what conversations are coming, right? Like you you have mm-hmm. to know that people aren't just going to say, oh, well, he's been ineffective, so you're scratching him. That's not the first – no one went there first. Everyone thought he was going to be traded. And so to me, it was creating a, a distraction where you th- – there wasn't really one up until that point. Ben was playing fine. The organization was saying the right stuff. So – it was just kind of, I don't want to say it was fading away because we're in a Canadian hockey market. Nothing fades away. <laughs> but I, I I do think that it was kind of back burnery. And then they brought it right mm. to the forefront again. And, and then not only do you play him on Saturday, but you play with Gaudreau and Monaghan. Like that was, we could argue about whether that's the first or second line. Either way, it's a prominent role on this hockey club. And so, uh, again, a very long-winded way of answering this. I have no idea where Sam Bennett and the Calgary Flames are. He could be traded by the time this come as, comes out, and I wouldn't be surprised. He could play another 13 years of the organization, and I would just be like, yeah, sure, whatever, man. Like, it, it is, it, it's so crazy, the, the the twists and turns that this has taken. I still think it is such a difficult trade to make, A, because of the enigma that the player is. We, we all know playoff Sam Bennett is a lot different than the Sam Bennett we see, whether it be 56 games, 68 games, or 82 games in a regular season. And also, we know that this season is different. And you're either trading him in the Canadian division, where, like, I, I would imagine he would come out just hellfire and brimstone against you. It, he, he would actually look like the Blasty jersey that, that that's fantastic behind you. Um, that's how fired up he would be. <laughs> and so that that would be a bit of a, a dangerous situation to get burned by playoff Sam Bennett if you trade him in division. But then if you're not, you're not getting anything for him for two weeks. And this is an important two weeks. And, and every week, two weeks is important for, for this team at this point. This isn't going to be a team that just coasts into the postseason, I, I don't think. So I, I don't – I still think it's too tough to trade him in season. For all of those reasons that I just laid out, I do think that this ends – with him being a member of the Seattle Kraken. And it's just, we, we had a lovely time. Those 18 goals were fantastic. You were great in the playoffs. Let's just move on with our lives. I I, I still get the sense that that's how this is going to end. It's a pretty interesting conversation. You went through it re- very beautifully there. There's <laughs> lots of moving pieces. Like he brought up the issue. The issue seems like you said, put on the back burner. The Flames, I thought, made it a bigger issue than it needed to be with the scratching of him, whether it was a coach's decision or not, whatever. But then there's something you didn't touch on with the injury to Derek Ryan. I wonder mm. then if that made them need Sam Bennett again and put him in that kind of a role again. But then they didn't put him where where Ryan normally plays. They put him up the lineup, like you mentioned. Very interesting. I. I, too, am along the lines of he will be in Seattle one way or another. Uh, but how it, how he gets there could be the interesting path we take. We got we got another game coming up. Uh, this will not air till Thursday, so there will be two games before this airs. But it's Winnipeg is the first game coming up. Do you put him right back up there with Monaghan and Gaudreau against Winnipeg, or are you looking to put him in a different role? Uh, I think that you stick with him with Gaudreau and Monaghan. And we've talked about this on the show a little bit. 
it, it's the 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 point that Sam Bennett has, or, or I guess the leg that he has to stand on in this whole thing, is that he's never really been given a consistent opportunity to play with the big boys, right? Like he'll get a couple of shifts and it'll actually look okay. And then for whatever reason, it, it gets changed. And you can just as easily make the argument that he hasn't deserved that. And I'm kind of more on that side. Um, and, and so I, I understand like both sides of that, but I do think if you're going to put him with Gaudreau and Monaghan, just go with it. Like just see what you actually have before you're making a move like this. Like I, I understand there could be a bit of a, well, we play for out in Edmonton. You play dry saddle with McDavid in a contract year. How do you think it's going to look now? Eventually we all knew dry saddle was going to be good anyway, but I do I do think that for for Sam Bennett, it is good to play with Monaghan and Gaudreau. It gives him the best opportunity to thrive, and you can kind of wash your hands of the no opportunities given um, argument, right? And so for also for the organization, playing with Johnny Gaudreau probably isn't going to hurt your trade value a whole lot. Like Johnny Gaudreau mm -hmm. has made a lot of guys look very, very good. And well, Dominic Simone has not been one of them so far. Um, <laughs> you, you can still, you can still see where it's boosting the trade value and you can show other teams that this is a guy who can play with high level people. And I think that that helps the trade value as well. So I, I think that if, if Jeff Ward called me tomorrow and asked me what I would do with the flames lineup for the next week in a bit, uh, I think Sam Bennett plays with Goudreau and Monaghan until either that they either they are just so offensively bad that you can't play them, uh, or we, we trade him like that. I I think you let that one ride out for a little bit. I agree with you there. I hosted a live show on Saturday, and one of the things that we got talking about on the show was the consistency or lack thereof in this case by Sam Bennett and by the Flames and how Jeff Ward is quick to go to the blender. He seems to be quick on that draw a lot. And how it would just benefit maybe a guy like Sam Bennett to be put on the line and just leave him alone. Let him go. Let him ride. And so I think what you said there is absolutely perfect. Let him ride with those guys. Let him build that value. And, you know, if you put him on that fourth line, he's going to play with who? Ronaldo or Lucic or something. And, you know, guys that aren't going to boost that value. If the Flames are looking to right. move this guy, having him play up that lineup is vitally important. Um, whether he deserves it or not again that's another debate for another time we won't have that here one guy though who we could debate should play higher in the lineup than he does but he also is very effective where he is playing is andrew magiapani he's a great partner for michael backland but he also has the skills and we've seen it to play on that top line what have you seen from andrew magiapani so far this season um, I, I have seen everything I've wanted to and then some from Andrew Manjapani. I am a very big fan of this dude. Uh, I think that he, like when we, you talk about the, the whole play the game the right way thing, that, that can be a, a remarkably tired cliche, but he is someone who does that. And he is the reason why when we have the, the Gaudreau conversations about not getting to tough areas and stuff like that, and people bring up the size, I push back because that dude is a dog to play against, Manjapani. He like the, the way that he battles, the way that he four checks um, again, like he, he's never, if, if the dude was my size, he'd be a hall of famer. Um, the, if you kept up all the other intangible things, like I just, I love the, the ferocity that he plays with. And I think that it's a positive for him that you could make a very compelling argument to put him on the top three lines on this team. Like I, I personally would love to see him with Kachuk and Lindholm. I think that that is a perfect fit. I think for him, him and Kachuk, play together very, very well. Uh, I think you could make a very good case that he works quite well with Monaghan and, and Gaudreau for the aforementioned goes into the dirty areas situation. Um, and I think he also is very effective with Michael Backlund. And I I was a little bit concerned coming into this season because of how ineffective Manjapani was when Kachuk went down with that injury in the postseason mm -hmm. against Dallas. And like Manjapani just disappeared. Now, so did everyone. Mm -hmm. But Manjapani was one that was a little... Oh, for me, because now you start to wonder how much of this is Manjapani, how much of this is Matthew Kachuk, and then you separate them at the start of the season, and it, it is Backlund, and it, in the last game it's Lucic, at times it's been Bennett, either way, not Matthew Kachuk in terms of playmaking ability and things like that, so um, uh, Lucic was an okay passer in his day, but that's another conversation. Um, <laughs> For, for for Manjapani, though, what, what I've seen this year, and again, a very long way of getting to this, so I apologize, but 
no, for, no, for Benjamin, what, I, what I've seen this year is someone who can play on his own and, and is someone who isn't reliant on a Matthew Kachuk to boost his value, isn't reliant on uh, a Michael Backlund to boost his value, because I would make the argument that it's been the other way around so far. And that is why, while I, I wish so badly to have Matthew Kachuk, Elias Lindholm, and Andrew Manjapani as the Flames' top line, I think right now the best part for Manjapani is beside Michael Backlund. There's a familiarity there for Backlund with Manjapani, so that kind of checks off that box that I talked about earlier with you with um, Michael Backlund not really being comfortable with his line mates. He's really comfortable with that dude. And I think that takes a bit of the pressure off, and I, I don't think it's a coincidence that Backlund's played his best hockey this season when Manjapani has been out there. And so while I don't think if Dubé dropped down to that spot in the lineup, there would be a, a giant like talent shift. Cause I think Dubé and Manjapani eventually end up kind of the same. And if Dubé actually passes Manjapani at some point, I'm not stunned, but I think for now, because of that familiarity, you can put Manjapani with Backlund and it's fine. And then Dubé with Lindholm and Kachuk is a fantastic learning experience for Dubé in kind of the, the next step in his progression. Yeah, I think those two are very interchangeable. When I did my pre-season lines, I had them a reverse where they currently are sitting on the roster, but I'm not shocked that it's flipped as well because of the things that you have mentioned there. One thing that did shock me, though, was the offseason the Flames had when they signed Chris Tanev, and I'll explain why. When you watch the Canucks play, you never really notice Chris Tanev. Uh, and there was a guy you, you turn on the TV, got to watch me some Tanev. So the Flames signed them, and I was kind of humming and hawing, and I asked someone to sell me on Chris Tanev, and they're like, just watch the things he does off the puck. Watch what he does to make his defensive partner comfortable in his game. And I'm like, okay. Then I watched him play for a few games and had a conversation with Lou on my show, and all of a sudden I'm a big Chris Tanev fan. What have you seen from the big burly defenseman on the back end for the Flames? Uh, well, I mean, a a fantastic shot to to score from your own blue line. Um, but yeah. I, I have for nice. for Chris Tan. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if you could class like I'm I'm so bad with the the terminology stuff. I don't know if you can classify that one as a tuck, as the as the kids say, because there wasn't a whole lot of tucking. Um, Ryan Pinder would. What, Yes, exactly. Yeah, well, Pinder would say a lot of things. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I can't say anything. We're 27 minutes into this thing. I've answered like six questions. Um, but for, <laughs> for, for Chris Tanev, um, just what you mentioned is what I've seen. How comfortable Noah Hannafin is when Tanev is out there. It, it is just like the, the most calming experience. And that whole, you don't notice him and that's actually a good thing conversation. Mm -hmm. I, I think Chris Tanev created that because it, it is just, you only notice him a couple of times a game, unless it's one of the early Vancouver games and he's blocking eight shots or whatever it was. Um, but he, he is just so calm out there. He is just so composed. And with that, it just kind of brings the, the the anxiety level of the whole shift down. And I think Markstrom has the same effect. Like it is, it, it's funny that you get kind of the, the hippie stereotype of, of Vancouver and you bring in two guys from the West Coast and they're just kind of chill, mellow, man. Like, I, I'm not suggesting anything recreational off the ice, but just how, how calm <laughs> they make everything on the ice. It, it really has a huge impact. And, and that is why, and I don't know if this is where you're going, but th this is why I would like to move him with Mark Giordano for a little bit. Because I do think the Flames captain is struggling. And it, it just... It hasn't like he hasn't made a, a ton of mistakes in the last couple of games that that have been overly costly, but, but it, it's just not the same from Geo as we've seen in the last few years. And I think adding that calming presence to to the Giordano group um, and just it just helps him out a little bit. And I think that can help round things out because I do think that Tanev has kind of like some of that Tanev dust has been sprinkled on Hannafin, and there's some more responsibility in his game. And I think him and Anderson could work really well. And so I think you could go from having one defensive pairing that you're comfortable with in all situations to having two. And that might be putting a lot on Tanev and it might be putting a lot on, on Hannafin. But I, I think enough of Tanev that he is someone where if that guy's, if, if one guy's not going, whether it's Geo, whether it's Valimaki, you can put him with that guy and it just calms everything down for a couple of days. And it just kind of lets, it just kind of lets them get settled in. Um, this is going to be a really forced analogy, but 
I, um, I, I've talked on, on the show that I, I've had some, some mental health stuff. And one of the things that has helped me is, is meditation. And it, if for like, I, I'm, I'm not overly enlightened. I'm not a, a fantastic visualizer, but it, it just kind of stops the momentum of everything for a bit. Mm -hmm. And it just settles everything down for a few minutes. And I think that again, super forced analogy, but I think that could be Tanev for Giordano where everything is just kind of a whirlwind right now. And it's just not clicking and it's so frustrating. And Tanev can just be that, <sighs> that Giordano can need. And I, I think that would be a, a really big help for him. You might think it's a forced analogy, but I totally can relate to that because I, I do have my own struggles as well. And that's something that I do as well. So I, I agree with that. I wasn't going to go there, but let's have the conversation <laughs> anyways because I think it's fascinating. I brought it up on Twitter where Tanev and Hannafin were going and they're going so well and they've only loved the one goal five on five this season, which is incredible. I mean, I brought up the suggestion like you might have just done, whereas maybe break those two up and let's get two pairs going. And then you have four guys going. And people shredded me on Twitter over it. And that's fine. That's what Twitter is. Right. But I, I like the idea because you've seen the struggles of Giordano and therefore Anderson hasn't been as effective as we know Rasmus can be. What is Mark Giordano for you this season for me he's struggled a bit he hasn't looked like mark giordano has been and he looks like the bubble mark giordano and maybe carried over a little bit into this season how have you seen it exactly the same way uh yeah i, I think he has struggled and i i, I made the note and the, the reason why i i'm questioning myself a little bit is i while i like to think of myself as a knower of all of everything sports um we, we have Corey sarich on after flames game days and i we brought it up with him like it just felt to me like every time the flames are stuck in their own zone it's giordano and it's anderson out there and strictly anecdotal, I'm sure there's a number where I could pull it up where it's like they're, oh, crap, they're stuck per 60. But I I just just watching the games, it just kind of feels like Gio is always stuck. And I, I brought it up with Saric, and he didn't see it that way. And so that's why I'm kind of questioning if I'm just kind of looking for that bubble Gio a little bit. But from what I've seen, he has certainly struggled. And it, it just um, – the, the phrase that Pat uses a lot is underwater. It feels like they are underwater a lot. And – Mm -hmm. On the one hand, it is totally understandable for a, a guy who is 37 or 38 years old to, to maybe be taking a step back and perhaps 25 minutes a night is too much for this guy. Like that, that is very reasonable to assume. And I, I do think that there is a little bit of like, just take something off of his plate. I think Balamaki is really close to being able to take on more responsibility. And so you, you can kind of chip in in the minutes that way. But still, this is a guy who is in the top four, at least in salary on your team. And for a while was the benchmark like that that dude is the cap you you do not mm -hmm. make more than than number five here and Matthew Kachuk happened but f for a long time this is someone who has been the standard bearer and salary wise you're still paying him like that and mm -hmm. th this is the problem with signing those long-term contracts is that eventually it, it's going to fall off a little bit and I'm not saying Gio is done but what I am saying is that th there's just been a step back taken and instead of just oh well screw it uh, I, I think you have to try to figure out how to maximize the six point whatever whatever that you're paying Giordano, and I think putting him with a Tanev is the best way to do that because I do think Gio has struggled this year. Yeah, I like the words you just used there, maximize, and that's where I went with these pairs as well. And I was trying to explain to people that if you can get two pairs going like you saw Hannafin and Tanev do early in the season so far here. You don't have to play one pair 25 minutes. You can play the two pairs closer to the 22-minute mark. And then you have a third pair that you have faith in because I really like what I've seen out of Nestroff on a whole. And I think Bella Mackey just keeps getting better and better and better. And I just wanted to bring that conversation up that you mentioned it because Mark Giordano is a great player. And this team will have to find a way to toe the line between loyalty and effectiveness on the ice. And I like how you brought that up. Very effective there. We're going to move away from the Flames now real quickly because there's a this this show started out as a Flames show, but I've slowly been adding more and more of the Western Canadian content to the show as I keep going. So let's quickly visit. We won't spend a ton of time with these teams, but let's spend some time talking about the guys to the north there and what we've seen from the Oilers so far. We know what McDavid brings. We know what Dreisaitl brings. So take those guys out of the equation for a second. What have you seen from the rest of the Oilers group this season? 
Uh, no defense, uh, for one. Like This is still a team that has major defensive issues, and it, it doesn't help when your goalie is playing every game but one. Um, like that, that as, as much as I like to rag on Koskinen, because I don't think he's very good, <laughs> and I, I think that people looking at some of the raw numbers of him versus Markstrom are insane. But I, I think for Edmonton, they have done their goalie no favors because this is still a team that struggles to defend. And I, I don't know why I thought that would be fixed, I, I guess I didn't think it would be fixed, fixed, but I thought it would be improved. And then you look at the offseason, it's like Dyson Barry's probably not fixing that, right? Like that's no. that's not necessarily his game. And so I, I like what they did at forward where they added some depth. And I thought that it just kind of the whole a uh, best defense is a good offense. And I mean, they've been trying that there forever. But I, I thought that you brought in some guys who could help control the play a little bit more so that while you're still not good at defending, you're not doing it as much. And some of the depth guys haven't really showed up yet. Um, like James Neal, um, obviously a, a delay to his season. And so that limits him a little bit. But again, if you're counting on him to be the savior, mm. um, what are the, I, I'm being very negative on them. And I, I still, <laughs> it's, you've noticed, I, I, I picked them to be second in the North Division to at the start of the season. I, I just thought like you have McDavid, you have Drysano, you add some forward depth. It checked the, the forward depth was a, a big box they checked off. And I thought they did enough on the blue line to maybe improve a little bit. And that just hasn't been there. It, it is just as it bad, just as bad as it was a season ago. And that's a big problem. The, the thing that I do like uh, about Edmonton and the reason why I have a bit more confidence that they'll be able to, to write the ship a little bit is um, Yessi Pugliarvi. I, he is, unrecognizable compared to the last time he was in the NHL. This is a guy who mm -hmm. I don't know if he just went overseas and just bullied everyone for a year, but he, he is now someone who not only likes to go to those dirty areas, but thrives in those dirty areas. Like that's where all of his goals are coming from. This went from a guy who was a, a bit showier, I guess, to like, he's not exactly this guy, but like kind of Dave Anderchuk, where it's just like all in the front of the net really working. And that is the perfect spot. To, to be in with a, a Connor McDavid. And so now you don't necessarily have to have Cassian with, with McDavid anymore, where you had Cassian playing that net front, create havoc, win puck battles, <laughs> those sorts of things. Now you can have Pugliarvi who does the same stuff, not quite as effectively, but does some of that stuff, but brings more high-end skill with it. And so I think that stretches things out a little bit more for Edmonton. So on a positive note, I think Pugliarvi can really, not that McDavid needed it, but can really help out that McDavid line and can really add a little bit of extra firepower to that group where I, I still think defensively that they have too many liabilities for me to consider them as much of a contender as I thought they were at the start of the season. I think I'll think that when you look at Dave Tippett and the way he coaches, oh, he's a defensive guy. He's a def Defensive mind is what he did in Dallas. He bored everyone to death, and they won a bunch of games when he was the coach there. We thought that, that he might be able to do that in Edmonton, and that just hasn't worked. Uh, Edmonton was the team that I picked that they finished second or second last, and neither would surprise me. They were, <laughs> for me, the biggest X factor in this division going into the season, and they're showing it because some nights they look tremendous, and then others did they just, like, gross. Uh, there's really another word I could use there. They just, they're not very good of a hockey team. And it looks like they're just still continually trying to outscore their problems. I wonder now with Mike Smith coming back, is Mike Smith going to be the guy to help stabilize at the back end? And if you're relying on Mike Smith, oh boy, <laughs> that could be a problem for your team in, in another direction. So we'll see how that shapes up for Edmonton. Um, mm -hmm. Vancouver has a very similar situation going on out there where it's burn at the stake. Or we don't know what's going on. Like we need to renew this whole team. They haven't gotten the goaltending. They thought they were going to be getting their back end looks very shaky and holy. What have you seen from Vancouver, uh, from your point of view? Uh, I've seen an extremely flawed team, and I, I think we we all knew that coming into the season. I, I thought that this would be a team that would compete for a playoff spot and ultimately fall short, and now they would kill for that. It, it has been a, a real, real tough time, especially lately for, for Vancouver, and, and I think 
a, a lot of this, and this isn't, uh, I don't think, a super hot take or, or breaking news, a lot of this goes on Jim Benning. And uh, how much of that can actually go on, on Canuck ownership, we could have that discussion. Neither of us really know, but we certainly know it's a bit of an issue. And so I think for Vancouver, it is just almost indefensible to have a roster this flawed in the final years of Hughes and Pedersen's entry level deals like that. You just, I, I cannot wrap my head around that because you, you are getting to elite level hockey players and Pedersen's not playing at an elite level this year, but you are getting guys who can play in an elite level at the bare minimum. And you are surrounding them with Jay Beagle <laughs> and with Louis Erickson. And, and I just, I, I can't, I can't wrap my head around that. And, and so to me, while Jim Benning started off very rough, and then made a couple of trades and everyone thought, oh, maybe there's actually something to this guy. I still think the, the cap management situation is so bad in Vancouver that I, I just, I don't see a way where he keeps his job. And, and that's, that's very glib to say, but I mean, people have said the same thing about me, so I'm allowed to say it. Um, but for, <laughs> for Vancouver, th this is the, the cautionary tale of every team that has cap space and they sign a contract and it's, ah, they can afford it. Like, look at Ottawa right now with Matt Murray. That was the biggest goalie contract that was handed out. And it was, oh, they have a ton of cap space. They can afford it. It's like, okay, but there's going to be a time where you're going to want that. And there's going to be a time where you don't have that cap space and you kind of need that money to be worth it. And so the contracts of Roussel and Beagle and bringing in Brandon Sutter, like those, it, it's just, it's one thing when you can afford it, but when you want to compete and you want to take that next step and you're missing out on Tyler Toffoli because you're paying Brandon Sutter $2.35 million, that's a problem. And when you can't surround Pedersen or Hughes with high-level players because you're paying Roussel and Beagle and Louis Erickson, that's a big problem. And the the Roberto Luongo thing didn't help. The the, the cap recapture thing, I, I think, is the, the silliest thing that we have seen. To penalize this team for a contract they signed before those rules came in is ridiculous. I, I think that, that that sucks, but that is a card you have been dealt, and, and this is far from the best way to deal with it. And so now for Vancouver... While you have these young players, and I, I don't think signing Pedersen or Hughes is going to be an issue. Like they, they are going to get them under contract. It's what you have around them after this that I think is going to be the problem. I, I just I don't know where that next level is. So for for Vancouver, you have the elite level talent, but they I, I just don't know where the room is to surround them with anything right now. Yeah, Vancouver has had some very poor cap management issues, and I think there's no weirdly way I can see out of it rather than just waiting for those contracts to end. And they've got some big guys cut for contract mentioned Hughes and Pedersen. Let's not forget about Hoglander in a couple seasons as well. Right. Another young kid, Demko, is going to need a raise sooner than later. Uh, so they have some problems to work out there, and it'll be interesting to see if they can fix that. But as for their on-ice performance, I'm right there with you. They're not looking in the rearview mirror for Ottawa. They should be because that's how they are playing since Ottawa is the only team they've been able to see them to play NHL hockey against. And we all know that Ottawa is not a full NHL team right now. So yeah. it's saying a little something about Vancouver. Um, they got their doors blown off for them by Montreal and Toronto this past weekend too. So that didn't help the confidence though. We witnessed three games in a row with the Flames playing the Winnipeg Jets. The Jets didn't have Patrick Liney because they traded him. They didn't have Dubois because he was still being quarantined. And they still look tremendous. Uh, I thought the Jets played a very good hockey game. They played they got five out of six points versus the Flames in those three games. What says you about the Winnipeg Jets in this season? Uh, I, I really like Winnipeg. I, I like a lot of pieces Winnipeg has. Um, I, I still don't like that blue line. And I still think that blue line is going to be an issue. But the thing that I like, is, and it's something that was, I saw, I forget who said it, um, but a couple of years ago, I saw it on social media. And like, you, you mentioned Dave Tippett before. Well, when you think of a Dave Tippett team, it is strong defensively, boring as all hell, and they win a bunch of games two to one, and that's fantastic. When you think John Tortorella team, shot blocking, all of these types of things. Like all these coaches have this identity. When you think of a Paul Maurice team, 
it's tough to come to that right away because they have he, he can just okay well i have all these guys in toronto we're going to play this way i have all these guys in carolina this is the way we're going to play and with winnipeg he recognizes that that blue line is not i think where it needs to be i think all like they don't have non NHLers on that blue line but it just feels like uh peter labardius likes to talk about slotting it feels like Winnipeg's mm -hmm. blue line just doesn't slot where it needs to right now. And he recognizes that. And the Flames games were perfect examples. Winnipeg gets that, that two-goal advantage um, off of a, a couple of, whether it be rough breaks or sloppy play or whatever from the Flames. They get up two to, uh, they get up three to one, and they just sink. And there is no room in the middle of the ice. And it's like, look, we, we know we don't necessarily have the, the Shea Theodores or the, the Quinn Hughes or, or any of those guys, while I think Morrissey can eventually work up to that, what we're going to do is just make this a five-man unit and just clog. And so if you want to get to these tough areas, if you want to get to the high-danger scoring chances, you're going to have to work your ass off to do it. And the Flames in the, the last game against Winnipeg, down two goals in the third period, got one high-danger chance. That says a lot about the Flames, but it also says a lot about what Winnipeg has been able to do. And so when you get that level of buy-in mm -hmm. from your guys, I, I think it's a master job from uh, from Paul Maurice. And then you add on top of that, Mark Shifley, um, uh, Kyle Connor continues to blow me away anytime I see him. Like he is someone who mm -hmm. every time I watch him, he just raises higher and higher and higher for me. And I, I think like Ehlers, I would watch him in the fastest skater competition any day. Blake Wheeler has certainly been mm -hmm. a hot button issue, but I, I think when he is going, he can be very good as well. And so I, I think when you have that high end skill and then the high end buy in that this team is getting, I'll be interested to see how Dubois fits. I'm interested to see how they stack up their forward group just in general. If Cop stays up there with Shifley, if they move one of Stasny and Dubois over to the wing just to to have your top six forwards be in your top six, or do they go the, the Calgary route like we talked about and kind of spread it out a little bit more? I'm I'm fascinated to see how it all fits, but Winnipeg is one of those teams where if you are a Winnipeg Jets fan, this is an easy team to fall in love with, right? Because of how hard they play, the high end skill, and the goalie's awesome as well. So yeah, I I like a lot of what I see from Winnipeg. If Winnipeg goes that route with the center depth, that makes Adam Lowry more fine center. How insane would that look on paper? Oh. I would hate to try to game for something like that. So. Interesting what they have going on in Winnipeg. I, I wonder if there is another move down the line to help that blue line out. As you mentioned, it's not the best, but they make it work, and I really enjoy the job Paul Maurice. Does. And I've been completely wrong on Winnipeg so far this year. they missing the playoffs. I don't see how they miss the way that they're playing. So good on Paul Maurice and the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, in true Boomer fashion, like I said, at the top, we're going over time already, but I wanted to get a quick thought on this before I let you go. The Western Hockey League and even the AJHL are still working to get their seasons back up and running. We've gotten the okay in Alberta. Uh, there's been okay across the rest of most of Canada now and the United States for the Western Hockey League. What is your confidence like that this season can get going and that these kids will have a chance to at least show a bit of what they have over a 24 game schedule? It's so tough, right? Because like we are seeing the NHL, a, a billion dollar industry is having a, a tough time with this thing. And when you have that and everything that they've put into it, it, it just, it gets very difficult to see how the, specifically the AJ, uh, but how the WHL is going to be able to, to pull it off. And I hope I'm wrong. I, I really do. This is not me cheering against hockey or, or anything like that. This is just me looking at, at this whole thing realistically and seeing that, it's just COVID is so difficult to figure out. And, and this thing with the linesmen in the NHL right now is a, a little bit concerning that there's potential that there's on ice transmission now. Mm -hmm. And once you get into that, it, it's really tough to, to get a grasp on this. And so mm -hmm. for, for the WHL to, to be able to afford that amount of testing on a day in day out basis, they, they probably could, I, I think they could do it. Um, I don't know what the, their books look like, but for, for the AJ, financially it, it just feels like it would be a lot and it breaks my heart because like i my, my first regular play-by-play -play gig was with the calgary canucks in the alberta junior hockey league uh, a lot longer ago than i'd like to admit um 
but I, I like I love that league so much, and it, it's been awesome to see a lot of the players from that league now have the success that they've had. But it, it just it feels like this year is such an uphill climb for them. I, I don't I, I logistically I, I want to be wrong, and Lord knows I have been before, but I, I just don't see how it works. Fair enough. I I really hope that they can get the Western Hockey League going and the mm-hmm. AHL going. Um, those who follow my journey have known that I've covered the Western Hockey League for a few years now with the Left Hurricanes. I love the league. I love watching the players grow. Um, I watched Dylan Cousins come in the league as a 15-year-old scoring an important playoff game to now being at the National Hockey League. And the journeys are very special and fun to watch. And I hope these kids that are coming up now have that opportunity as well this season. Peter, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for your insight. It was a very fun chat. Definitely would like to get you on again uh, and have another another chat. Um, I appreciate your time and let me go over just a little bit as well. Um, thank you so much for your insight on everything today. Yeah, not a problem. This was fun. And uh, the, the only reason you went over is because I'm very long-winded on everything. So uh, <laughs> th- it is no fault of your own that we are going over. It is entirely your guest's fault. <laughs> well, we can share on the blame there, so that's all good. <laughs> We're already hearing you on the big show tomorrow. Peter, thank you so much for your time today. All right, thank you.